This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. Welcome to another edition of Kingdom, Kingdom, <laughs> Biblical Life TV. I don't even know what page I'm on. I feel like the Dunkin' Donut man here lately. Uh, we're going to be starting a sub-series within Understanding the Kingdom called Developing Kingdom Muscle for the Days Ahead. And uh, there's no way I'm going to get it done today. In fact, I've got enough notes here that I've probably got enough for three sessions. And so I'm going to kind of watch the clock. Otherwise, we'll be here till like three in the afternoon and we'll have enough for four or five episodes. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I want to go to Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 27. You know, we have had, and Mary and I have been sharing this for years, we have had a good portion of the body of Christ that has ridden on the apron strings of past generations that have walked with God. Whether it's blessing or protection. But guys, we're now in a time that the individual walk with God is what makes the difference. Not the group, not because I go to such and such a church or so and so is my pastor. That is not going to, that's not going to make it in the days ahead. It is our personal walk with Jesus that is going to establish the protection and establish the blessing in, the li in our lives. And so one of these, I'm actually going to kick over a sacred cow, especially in the charismatic movement. And I'm going to read this first from the King James Version of the Bible. And it's dealing with a time when, when the remnant are coming back. And it says, It shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from off, his sho off thy shoulders, and his yoke from off thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. How many have ever heard that preached over the years? With the implication that we need to find an anointed minister, and you just sit under that anointing, and you sit under that anointing until the yoke is broken. And the side note of that is, well, if the yoke isn't broken, he's just not anointed enough, and it causes them to run from preacher to preacher to preacher to preacher. I've actually, when with Hear the Watchman, I actually had one lady walk up to me and says, well, I want you to pray for me, but before you do, I want to know what you got. You know, like, what kind of, what kind of Ronco prize are you going to give? You know, what kind, what kind of anointing do you have? And I'm thinking, you just listen to me for the last 90 minutes, if you don't know. But it's this mentality that it's external, that it's somebody else's responsibility to be anointed. And if they are anointed, then the yoke is going to be broken. Unfortunately, when you begin examining the Hebrew, now we, we need to understand that at the time of the translation of the King James Version of the Bible, Hebrew was almost a dead language even among many of the Jewish people. They, they went from Hebrew to Yiddish and, and other things. But the Reformers, because they wanted to be able to accurately uh, interpret the Word of God and accurately understand the Old Testament, they began to revive Hebrew. 
And so there was this learning curve. And we're still, and even now we're just still discovering because many, many times when you, whenever you interpret Greek or Hebrew, you have to understand the culture as well as the context to properly interpret a verse. If you don't, you can completely miss it because culture does not translate. You have to add it to it, and then you have to look at the context, because whether it's Greek or Hebrew, I mean, there's been times I've, I've looked in the lexicon and said, oh, great, there's like 72 different ways that that word can be translated. And sometimes it can mean the opposite. The very, like shub in Hebrew, to return, to repent, can also mean to walk away from. And so you're, you're looking, uh, do I, am I going back? And of course, at the same time, you have to walk away from to go back to. But it, it takes the context of what is being said to understand that which is being left and that which is being returned to. Okay? And so in the case, I, I think in this, they, they really misinterpreted the Scripture because you have to set it back into context. And to understand the context, we've got to go back to verse 20. In fact, years ago when I was going through hermeneutical classes, one of the things they shared is that whenever you interpret anything, it says kind of like dropping a pebble in water, how you'll have the rings go out. And that verse, the way that you interpret that verse, has to then be expanded that it's in line with the chapter. And then it has to be in line with the book of the Bible. And then it's got to be in line with all of the Bible. If it's foreign, if your interpretation is foreign to the majority of the Scripture, then you have a bad interpretation. And it's the same way with, with this, translating it. Now, setting the context, Isaiah begins prophesying, listen, you guys are going to go into bondage. We know about the northern tribes going into bondage and, the, and then the southern tribes go into bondage. But God doesn't lay there. The, Isaiah is really a neat book because although it, it, uh, it says, Game over! You're being judged of God! But he's still going to bless you. He's still going to call you back out. And in the midst of, of pronouncing judgment, out of the same breath, he'll begin prophesying about Messiah. It's the coolest stuff. I love the book of Isaiah. In fact, I've got a book of Isaiah. It's probably one of the best commentaries ever written on the book of Isaiah. The man spent 20 years on his knees, literally in his prayer chamber, researching the book of Isaiah. And he only did one commentary. Well, if it took you 20 years on your knees. In fact, if I understand right, unless I'm getting my commentators messed up for a time, he, uh, he taught up in, up in Springfield. I believe up at Evangel CBC. And what I heard from the students, it said, he didn't teach Isaiah. He weeped through Isaiah. He spent an entire semester weeping through Isaiah because he understood the implications and the power of what was being revealed. Okay? It says, Now in that day the remnant of Israel and those of the house of Jacob, so you have the northern tribes and the southern tribes, who escaped will never again rely on the one who struck them. The world system, mystery Babylon, those that have been their oppressors. They're never again going to rely on them, but will truly rely on the Lord the Holy One of Israel. And what's interesting in some translations, instead of the word truly, it says they will rely on the Lord in truth. Kind of like how Jesus said, and the truth shall make you, you will know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If you're relying on the Lord based upon fiction, you're not relying on the Lord. If you rely on the Lord on what somebody else preached that's not biblical, you're not relying on the Lord. How I many know there's been a lot of unbiblical things that have been preached and have caught hold? And now's the way to preach it. 
And it's no more biblical than the man on the moon when you set it back in context. We live in a time of snippet theology, of hyper grace. It's got to be in truth. And then he stresses it again. A remnant will return the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. And I love, whenever you see in prophecy, Jacob. How many know Jacob was his original name, which meant Sir Planner? Conniver. And how many know that before he wrestled with God, he did a lot of conniving? Okay, cheated his brother out of his birthright. Pretended to be his brother to get the blessing of the firstborn son. He was wrestling for that, which if he would have simply yielded to God, God would have gave him. But it was only after Jacob wrestled with God. The Bible said that day forward he walked with a limp, which shows that his walk was different. And it was only after that that he became known as Israel. You know what I see when I see that? I see hope for us. The old conniver, I just want a blessing. I'll I'll do whatever, I'll, I'll connive, I'll twist scripture, I'll do anything for a blessing. God says, I got your number. Because for all of us, there is coming a day of wrestling with the Lord. And in that moment, we're going to learn to no longer trust in the world systems, but to trust in Him and Him alone. Everybody's just so worried about the new world order. The old new world order was established right after World War II. And to be truthful, we have been living under a new world order, many of them over and over again ever since Nimrod. In fact, the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw was laying out all the various new world orders that would happen until Jesus says, you know what, let me show you what I'm going to think, what I'm going to do with your new, 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 new world orders is I am going to come down and I'm going to destroy it until there's nothing left. And then I'm going to become the mountain of truth that rules the world. It's called the millennial reign. I can't wait. In that day, there will be no Democrats or Republicans. In that day, there will be no politicians. <laughs> Messiah will rule and reign from Jerusalem. He'll reign with a rod of iron. That means he doesn't put up with politics and all the shenanigans and all the under-the-table deals. How many know that under-the-table deals then will have a life expectancy of about three seconds? Why? Because one of the redeemed will show up. Doesn't even have to travel. We got glorified bodies. We'll be able to just show up and walk through walls. Have you seen Jesus after the resurrection? That's what we get. You want to talk about dragnet. What you do when the king says you can't do. Oh, Mike, it's not going to be that way. The Bible says that each representative, each nation, if they do not bring a delegation to honor him during the Feast of Tabernacles, the next year their land will have no rain. How many of those spells famine? You, you, you don't mess with the king who's ruling in righteousness. We get to rely on him. But the interesting thing about this, set the picture They're in captivity to the mystery religion nations. Because of their sin, they're they're under captivity. And in the midst of this captivity, they can learn how to trust and rely in the Lord alone and not in their taskmasters. Not in the world system, but in the kingdom. You see, the dynamic of the kingdom is you got to learn how to be in it to get out of the other. You've got to learn how to trust in God in the midst of the bondage. The only way out of the bondage is to trust Him while you're still in bondage, not waiting on someone else to believe for you. 
And you say, but Mike, you don't know the extent of my bondage. Well, I read in the, in the Gospels where there was one man whose son, this demon would keep on manifesting and throwing him into the fire. And there was this big showdown with his disciples. Each one tried to up the other. None of them could cast him out. And finally, Jesus comes along. The guy says, listen, your tag rag team of 12 couldn't do a thing. Can you do something? And he says, do you believe? And he says, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. I want to rely on, I'm trying to rely on, help me to rely on. Don't let the devil put a guilt trip on you saying, you'll never learn how to, re how to rely on the Lord. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. He'll try to get you, you know, if you, if you relied enough on the Lord, you'd already be free. Well, it's a process. And we're going to see that process really, really clear when we go back. Let's see, I've already covered this. I'm preaching and I'm preaching beyond my notes. <laughs> but this word rely means uh, shana, which means to lean on, to trust on, to support. And I love how the NASB lexicon adds, rest yourself upon. Do you ever see a small child when they're tired and they're sitting by mom and dad, what do they do? And if you're not careful, they'll just be all over your lap and they'll be arms this way and feet up this way. Because they have learned to, their safety with mom and dad, and so they have learned to just lean on them. I think it's our own hubris that we don't learn to just lean on the Lord. I mean, you know, there's some things that God has told Mary and I to do, and especially now in our 60s, we're trying to, we're, we're trying to believe for God to heal us of old age, okay? Because it's like... <sighs> Why didn't I do this when I was 30? You know what I mean? Okay. But I lean not to my own understanding. And we're, we're learning to lean on him, which also means we don't let external things control us, but our Heavenly Father, he sets the pace, he sets the agenda. And there, there, there comes a peace with that. Because I don't want to run behind him, but I also never want to run ahead of him or try to do it under my own auspices. And that's the, that's the relying, and of course, the shub means to turn back. Guys, we got to return to the Lord. This is the remnant, return to the Lord. Shub means to repent, to restore, to reject one way and go back to another. Go back to God's way. Okay. Rely on to trust in. The remnant of Jacob, Whew. we dealt with that. But now I want to read this to you out of the NASB, and there's a lot of modern translations. We've learned more about Hebrew that actually nails this verse. And I mean, they, they, not, they, they not only hit the nail on the head, but they knock it clear through the board, okay? So will be in that day that his burden will be removed from your shoulders and his yoke from your neck and the yoke will be broken because of fatness. No, I'm not talking about physical fatness. But he's painting a picture because Mystery Babylon had reduced the people of God to nothing more than a beast of burden, an oxen. And we need to understand this like in Egypt. The only reason that... The financial systems and the New World Order have anything to build on is they've got to build it on the blessing that the body of Christ produces. What we see in the book of Revelation, we see in the nine plagues of Egypt. Because of Joseph, you know, the Pharaoh was Pharaoh, but he didn't own a lot until Joseph got there. And then because of of him having the only food, he grew rich and ended up people in Egypt sold, sold most of their land to the Pharaoh for food so that on the other, year, the other end of that seven years, he owned most of Egypt. Okay, 
So the great prosperity of the Pharaoh came from the blessing that was on Joseph. They took that blessing for granted. Then they subjugated God's people so they could draw all the blessing out of it. Part of the nine plagues of Egypt were not only judging the gods of Egypt, it stripped the wealth that Egypt had gained from God's blessing on his people. And just to put the eye on the, on the, the dot on the eye and the crossing the T, what gold and silver they had left in jewels, Israel walked out of. They, they paid them for 400 years of bondage and took the wealth of Egypt with them as they marched out. Why we see the damage and all the things that we do in the book of Revelation is Moses was a type and shadow of Messiah. So the plagues and everything that we see in the book of Revelation, God is stripping the earth of the blessing that only came because of his people that the world system had enslaved. Let me tell you something. The Masons did not have enough power to get anything done as far as founding a nation. They had to wait for the revivals of Edwards and Whitfield to create the moral character and the righteousness necessary for a democratic republic. The reason the republic is falling apart is they have stripped the gospel and the holiness and righteousness that are supposed to be in the people to uphold it. And now what we're seeing is a crumbling because there are no foundations. The Constitution by itself is nothing more than a piece of paper if it doesn't have the Bible and those that believe in the Bible propping it up with righteousness. Whew. Let me come back to my notes. It was what? Fatness, okay? And it's, it's painting this picture of an, a, a half-starved oxen under oppression, but even with the yoke and the burden of his taskmasters there, He's learning how to trust in the Lord and not the taskmaster. And it causes the blessing to come upon him in the midst of bondage. And he starts gaining weight. And he starts building muscle. And all of a sudden he gets so big that it snaps the yoke. We, and so it's talking about internal anointing, not external anointing. That flips the switch on 90% of what we do in ministry. My job is to get you to return to the Lord and to understand the Word and understand the kingdom so that the kingdom gets so big on the inside of you, the restraints the enemy has put on the outside of you begin to snap under the pressure of who you are in Christ. But what we have done, we have turned Christianity into a spectator sport. Well, preacher, how anointed are you? Never mind how anointed I am. You better start worrying about how anointed and fat in the Lord you are. Because a little dab will not do you. There was, there was a power team that went around for a while. And they were all Christians. And I mean, they would take those big, thick, you know, I'm from St. Louis. I look at these little phone books around here and I just laugh. That size comic book. I mean, phone books like this. And they'll take those and they'll just rip it in half. Do you see those guys when they, they bulk up before they go out and work out? I mean, they do me proud, man. They, you know, I'm having pasta. How big is that bowl? They eat like Jethro off the Beverly Hillbillies. They eat whole loaves of bread. They're bulking up to feed the muscle. How much of the Word are you consuming? How much of the presence of God are you consuming? One of the things I have found, and any woman knows this, that milk 
is pre-digested meat. It's pre-digested food, okay? And that is what is fed to babies because they don't have the ability to digest strong meat or strong food. And when we talk about the preaching of the Word, all that I can utter, as deep as I go, all that I can utter is milk. But when you've been studying and you've been praying and the Holy Ghost has been working on you, then the preached Word, the milk of the Word can be transformed to meat because it adds to everything else God's already been doing in your life. What I do should supplement, not to be a complete replacement of, but a supplement to what you've been doing. And based on where you are in God, I can say something which sparks you connecting the dot from here to here to here, and that connection becomes spiritual meat to you. Okay? In fact, when we look at the word anointing, shamin in Hebrew, and this, this, I I, I love how logos will actually give you the sense of the word, because I mean, you can get lost in lexicons, you know, and I, I can only look at so many different words for fat, 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 oily, fat, 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 oily, and it means, they said that the sense is body fat, excess bodily weight. In other words, you get so big by trusting in God, it snaps the yoke. Which is different than you being all half-starved, any yoke, not being able to do something. Somebody's coming on the outside and trying to get that thing greasy enough so that you can slip your head out. It doesn't work that way, and it never has. The only exception is for someone who, especially an evangelistic anointing, that will have an anointing for healing and miracles that you don't even have to be a believer to get healed or to have a miracle because it now proves to you the reality of who Jesus is. But everything else, we've got to spend time in God's gym. And what I have found that relying on You may start out with those little two-pound weights. But I I remember years ago when I went to the gym, and before I quit, I actually got to where I could curl 45 pounds with with one hand. And I thought, that was something. Because on that wall, it was like at the end of the wall, they started out like with one-pound weights. And then I saw Bruno go in there, and he turned to the other wall. (sighs) I had ne- all the time I had been in that gym, I had never looked at that wall. It started at 50 pounds and went up to 130. I thought, man, I'm something. Oh, that's what the big bulls go after is over here. <laughs> what that means is as we grow in God, he's trying to get us to where the heavier things in our life We learn as we rely on him, it's like pushing those weights in the gym. That's why he always calls us to stretch our faith, to stretch our reliance on him. The more that I learn to rely on him, the less I learn to rely on the world. That's how, like Isaac, you can sow in the middle of famine and have a hundredfold return. Because it's not the circumstances around you, it's the God who can circumvent the circumstances. The number one area of growth right now in the body of Christ, and I believe it is because of the way that we have preached grace. We've gotten chummy with the Lord. Too familiar with God. Like, He's my bud. No, he is the king of the universe. Now, while he has extended and said, I will be a friend to you, and I'll be closer than a brother to you, you do not forget his station in the order of the universe. Okay? But we have done that. 
we have been flippant about saying, the Lord has told me, or the Lord has shown me, or this is what God wants. There's this whole process when we begin studying one of the Hebrew words for worship we have really lost. And have you ever seen when, let's say, somebody in England would go up and they're having an audience with the Queen of England, what do they do? They bow. Uh, In the Orient, they really understood the power structure and they would bow to someone of, of greater authority and greater power. But the Hebrew word goes a whole lot further. It means you bow down all the way to the ground and that your knees and your shoulders and and your head are on the ground. That is biblically worship. And if you have never gotten there, you have never really worshipped to that level. You see, I want to get to the place. The day that Solomon dedicated the temple... He looked at the temple, and he kind of looked at God. And basically he said, we've built this temple, but the universe is not big enough to contain the God that we serve. In, in like King James will say, the heavens, the highest of the heavens. Ha'olam, the universe. God's index finger could fill the universe. Most of him still resides in eternity. I remember years ago, I was saying, God, I, I need to understand your vastness. And, and he said, let me, let me get you just a, an illustration, something you can wrap your head around, because when you start dealing with God, unless he reveals it, You can't figure it out. He's beyond our understanding. That's why we have the Bible. If it wasn't for the special revelation of God, none of us would have a clue. And so he showed me our spiral galaxy that we're in. He said, let's use this as a reference point that this is eternity. And then it was kind of like one of those things where you see the poster, you're there. This little, this little star right here, this is your solar system. You zoom in. And he said, now, zoom in on my office at home. And, I, and he said, now, zoom in, because I, I was at, at home, my, one of my favorite things. I got a quart dr- uh, mason jar that I drank out of all the time. It's just handy, and it holds enough. And he said, the spiral galaxy is eternity, and your mason jar is the universe. And I feel eternity. And he said, my throne in the third heaven, he said, I poked a hole from eternity into the third heaven. And he says, what they can see of me through that poked hole over my throne causes the seraphim to cry out, holy, holy, holy. And they have not ceased. Because uh, Dr. R.C. Sproul taught that well, well, the reason they're doing that is in those moments between one holy to another, they're seeing an aspect of God that they had never seen before. They've been doing that ever since creation. That is how big our God is. And so when you read the Apostle Paul writing that the fullness of the Godhead was contained bodily in Jesus Jesus walked around with the fullness of that which only eternity could hold and walked around in human flesh No wonder when he comes back, all the enemy that have gathered for the final showdown are simply, they're vaporized at the glory of his appearing. That's the one that we have to deal with. But the body 
has lost the concept of the fear of the Lord. I taught on this in, uh, in both, let's see, what was it? The, I, I can't remember if it was the leader of one or the kingdom priest or the priest of the believer course I did for the, the seminary, but I also dealt with it quite a bit uh, in the kingdom priesthood. Because the whole process of doing your outer court and inner court work is to establish the fear of the Lord to bring you into the holy of holies where you have that, you have that experience with God that you lay face down before him overwhelmed at his presence. That that changes you. And that you're never going to be the same again after that. And it's from that forge that a true spiritual warrior is made and not a second before. That's why I had to do the priesthood separate from the kingdom warrior. This is found in Isaiah chapter 11. When you read in the book of Revelation, the King James says the seven spirits of God. How many know there are not seven Holy Spirits? And I, I quote in, in the kingdom priesthood some of the top Greek experts on the planet which say the best rendition is the sevenfold Spirit of God. Is, have, have you ever held a, a real diamond and you catch it right in the light and you see all these uh, facets, you know? And uh, the Holy Spirit has seven of them. And why is Messiah Messiah? Because he was anointed of God. In Greek we call Christos. The one that is anointed. Anointed by who? The Holy Spirit came and released his sevenfold nature within Messiah. That's why the unforgivable sin is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. But because to say that Jesus was not the anointed one and the things that he did were not done by the Holy Spirit but by a demon is absolute blasphemy. Okay? And so Isaiah is sharing with us the sevenfold anointing of Messiah. Now, what's so great in this? What is available in Messiah is available to us because we're in Him. So that anointing, as I have been sent. He was the anointed one that was sent, so send I you. We get the term Christian not because of the Catholic Church. I've had some in the Hebraic Roots movement email me and say, how dare you use the, na the name Christian? It was given by Constantine, yada, yada, yada. I said, well, you don't know your church history, do you? It was a mocking word in Antioch. After the destruction of Jerusalem, the church moved to Antioch. That, so it went from Jerusalem to Antioch. And they said, you're just a bunch of Christos is running around just trying to be like Jesus. And they wore it as a badge of honor. My greatest aspiration is to be like Jesus. And if I come in contact with you, and the fragrance of him is what lingers, I've done my job. And so they took that as a badge of honor. And right now, for most of Christianity, Christianity is not a proper term anymore because the fragrance of Messiah is missing. We're not seeing the seven anointings of Messiah manifested in his people. Let's get into this in verse 1. And then a shoot will spring... For, or, and then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Underline that in your Bible. Will rest upon him. What did John the Baptist say about the Holy Spirit? He descended on him and stayed. He was proclaiming Isaiah 11.1. Over Jesus. I am a witness. Jesus said he was the greatest prophet that had ever lived. Greater than Isaiah. Why? He saw and was a part of what they all longed to understand. 
And he said, I bear witness that I saw the Spirit of God descend on him like a dove and remained. That is the task of the Christian, is we have got to learn to live a life that the Holy... Now, how many know the Holy Spirit is always with us? I want the manifestation of the Holy Spirit 24-7. Okay? Not just in theory, okay, I don't want him just stuck as a prisoner in my spirit. I want him to be able to flow around me in everything that I do and to help check my attitudes because he can be easily grieved. And one of the New Testament commandments is grieve not the Spirit of God. Why? You don't want his manifestation to fly away. Oh, Mike, that doesn't happen. Yes, it does. Why is it 99% of the churches are all, come on back in here. We need some manifestations. Am I making sense? And see, I'm just as guilty as everybody else. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge, and underline this, and the fear of the Lord. But see what the, the key, the most precious one, I think if you, if you looked at a, at a menorah, the key is the center one that supports everything else. I think what supports is the fear of the Lord. Because the very next verse says, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. His motivation, everything that he does is based upon the fear of the Lord. That's why Jesus always said, I, don't, I didn't come to share with you my opinion. I came to share what he who sent me has said. Everything I do, if he does it, if I see him do it in heaven, I do it here. If he ain't moving, I'm not moving. Because he functioned out of the fear of the Lord, the reverential fear of Almighty God. And it caused something to happen. This, I don't think, is not just in the millennial reign, but I think Jesus was doing it during his three-and-a-half-year ministry because it goes on to say, he will not judge by what he sees nor makes decisions by what he hears or what his ears hear. I mean, Nathaniel walked up and he said, man, I, here's a man in whom there's no guile and I saw you sitting underneath the tree when they come and got you. He, he knew because he had already seen in the Spirit. He knew the heart of the people that even tried to challenge him. So he was not moved by what he saw. He was not moved by what he heard. But he was moved by that which God revealed to him. Man, if we're ever in a time that we can't be moved by what we see or moved by what we hear, it's right now. Even if we say, I saw it on video. Video can be faked to the place. You can't tell the difference from that and the real thing. You cannot tell. There is AI software that they can, uh, and I, I saw them do this with uh, former President Obama. They took snippets of his, of, of his images. They took snippets of, his, of sound bites of his body to where the, where the AI could build his vocabulary and created a digital video of him saying a, a, a speech that he had never given. And you could not tell it from the real deal. That's why half the stuff I see, you know, this is going on in D.C., this is going on in D.C., this is going on here. Trump is actually on moon base alpha. We got video of him and you can see the moon behind him. Don't care. It's got to be what the Spirit of God is saying. Well, what's the Spirit of God saying? The Spirit of God is saying what's up there right now is false. It's nothing but a Hollywood prop. What does that mean? I don't know. I can't wait to find out. How about you? Okay. But this word, Yira in, in Hebrew means fear. It means terror. It means to, uh, that an awesome or ter terrifying thing to have respect. Now, when you look at it again in, in Logos, 
I love this. Fear, a feeling of profound respect. Not just respect, profound respect. You know, I've, I've had something happen to me when, when I'm on the road. You know, have people watch you on video. And, you know, of course, I've done this with others. You walk up and you, <laughs> you can't hardly say anything because there's this respect for them as well as nervousness. And I see it from, for me and I thought, boy, if you only knew me, you'd, you'd trash that away, you know. Because if it wasn't for the Holy Ghost, I put my foot in my mouth all the time. I look at Peter and I think, I think there's a direct bloodline relation to the Apostle Peter. <laughs> Mary will testify. She could write a book. Okay. We need to have that for God. Do you know when you're really going to understand this book? When you walk to it not to prove your theory, but you so fear him that unless the Holy Spirit using proper hermeneutics reveals it to you, you're not going to believe it. That's why we can have higher textual criticism of unsafe people. I actually had a, a Catholic priest tell me when, when, I was, when I was a teenager, and he found out I was called to ministry and I was a Protestant. He said, this book will drive you mad. I've not gotten to the mad, I've sure gotten to the glad. But to an unregenerated soul that does not have the Holy Spirit living within and does not fear God, this book will drive you crazy. Because it's only spiritually discerned. Every time I open the book, my spirit leaps and my mind is saying, what, what, what? I've had that literally happen and I'll go back and research, and there's been times just studying the begats of who begat who, and I start having church because all of a sudden you can, you can put that with the Bible stories and what their names meant, and you actually find out that what their name meant, what Mama gave them, was led by God to give them at birth, played out their entire lives. Here's a hint. Take the 12 sons of Israel put their names in the order of their births look up the origin what the what the meaning of their names mean and it's the story of messiah that you read in the gospels Whew. fear of god The King James says, and he shall make him of a quick understanding of the fear of the Lord. Alive. The fear of the Lord is the key that opens up all of the other anointings of Messiah. In Psalms 19 and 9, it says the fear of the Lord is clean. Enduring forever. How long's forever? If it was clean and precious in the Old Testament, how much more should it be clean and precious in the New? It goes on to say, And the judgments of the Lord are true, they are righteous altogether. So, all of you preaching against the commandments of God, stay in the New Testament because the Old Testament would convict you. It's almost gotten to the place where it's treasonous acts. Why? Because of grace, I can do anything I want to do, and now sin is okay. That is treason in the kingdom of God. He set me free of that. We always talk about authority. Now Jesus said, Behold, all authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Now you go. He got the authority back. He's delegating it to us. Exousia not only means authority, but the very first definition that you'll see in any good lexicon means literally the power of choice. When you trust in him, you're now given the ability to choose righteousness. To say anything other than that is to bring disgrace on the cross of Christ. Grace 
did not change sin. It set you free from it so that you wouldn't have to do it. That's a whole nother sermon. Psalms 110 or 111 verse 10. Remember, there was wisdom, there was understanding, there was knowledge, those anointings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding to those who do his commandments. Oh, there's that word again. You know what? I found out the world has its commandments too. You're either following the commandments of one master or the other. There's no neutralized zone. Oh no, they're my commandments. If they're of the flesh, they're hell's commandments. And then God has his. His praise endures forever. How about knowledge? Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Boy, you can put a lot of faces to that right now, can't you? People barely out of the birth canal that think that they know everything. Stick their nose up in the air. But I don't know. Let me tell you something from somebody who's been through that age. When you start beginning to move in intelligence is the day that you realize you don't know squat. Psalms 25 and 14, I want you to look this one up in your Bible. This one's good. How many know God has a secret that he wants to share with you? He's got secrets. God's got secrets. We know that from the book of Revelation. He's got a pet name for you. And if you overcome, you get a rock with a writ, not it, and only you and him know. Hopefully mine ain't perch. That's what my kinfolk call me because the first time that I, I went fishing, I caught a perch about this big and it just stuck, you know. But it says, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. In Hebrew, sod, S-O-D-E, means not only counsel like the divine counsel, but also means counsel like to be counseled. And it means the assembly or to be given secret counsel for those that have intimacy with God. Your intimacy with God can only extend to the place that you fear him. So the greater that you develop the fear of the Lord, the greater depth that God can take you. If we serve a God that the universe cannot contain, how many know that you don't get it all at the day that you get born again? No more than a baby coming out of the womb, do you go ahead and hand him the car keys and say, there's the car, get you some food if you want it. There are deeper levels to God. That's what always mystified me as a Baptist. They looked at the Pentecostals and said, you mean there's a second working of grace called the baptism of the Holy Spirit? What I've come to find out is there are a billion workings of grace. They go from faith to faith and glory to glory. I want to learn how to go where I have got to put on those deep, you know, those deep diving bell things, you know, that you see these divers put on. I want to learn to go so deep in God that I can't even see where the top of the water is anymore. And I think we're going to have prophets and apostles do that. Uh, there, there are fathoms to the grace of God. There are fathoms of understanding. I, I remember listening uh, to John G. Lake when uh, his first wife passed away. And she just had a hunger for the presence of God like nobody's business. And when he would be out ministering, she'd be home in prayer. And he got home one day and he said, the glory of God was just around her. He said it was almost blinding. And he said, I thought to myself, 
she goes much deeper, this world's not going to be able to hold her. And to this day, he said, she died a healed woman. It was that she got so full of God, according to his own memoirs, that the earth could no longer hold her and she just stepped on over to glory. Guys, we need to have some experiences to where, like Moses, we come down off the mountain and people are going up like this because it is simply his reflection that had been permeated into us as we were in his presence. Well, that's not normal Christianity. Yes, it is. We just forgot what it was. The secret of the Lord is to those that fear him and... So not only do we get to know his secrets, he will make them know his covenant. The secret to truly understanding covenant is to fear God. Until then, you don't really understand covenant. I've got one more because I've got four or five pages or more of these. They're so important. Psalms 33, 18 through 19. How many have heard, you know, with what's going on, they're predicting a food shortage. They're predicting this. They're predicting that. I've got a verse for you. Psalms 33, 18 and 19. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him and on those who hope for his kindness. Okay? Okay. We don't understand what it means for the eyes of God to be able to, the blessing. May the may the may the may the face of the Lord shine upon you. May His countenance be lifted up. That that means God's got me in His sights. When we get there, something called providence takes hold. Not everybody walks in providence. Providence is. Like Jesus when he was in Nazareth and they rose up to throw him, off a, throw him off the cliff and he just simply walked out from among them. That's called providence. Providence was a battle that we had in the Revolutionary War where we had two battleships from Great Britain that, would, that built the best battleships that was feared in all the earth. And it was a foggy night off the coast of, of Massachusetts or somewhere along the coast. And there was this mighty battle that raged all night long. And when the sun rose and the fog lifted, those two men of war ships were sunk to the bottom of the bay. And what sucked them was a little skivvy that was only big enough to hold two guys and a cannon on one end and a cannon on the other. And they would row this way and fire. The guy would reload. They would reload this way and fire. Sunk. Two of the biggest, baddest battleships of the British Army. That is called providence. Providence is when an Israeli tank, and you have, you have Egypt and all these coming, there was a great tank battle. Several battalions of tanks. And this tank broke a tread. If you break a tread on, tread on a tank, you just go around in circles. And so those, those relays in the tank, they just said, what are you going to do? We're going to shoot 365 until we run out of ammunition all night long. Boom, boom, boom. When the sun came up and one of them poked her head out, all they could see around them were blown up tanks. That's providence. Because the eyes of the Lord were on them. I want you to understand the depth of this. How do you walk out of great tribulation? How do you walk out of a fiery furnace and not even smell the smoke? It's because the eye of the Lord is upon you. <laughs> I like verse 19. Are you ready for verse 19? To deliver their souls from death and to keep them alive in famine. I love truckers, 
Sometimes I do get a little frustrated on the highway, but the more truckers I see going with provisions, especially, I mean, there, there, were, there was a time in America when the, in the toilet paper shortage, it's like fill them bad boys up with toilet paper and get them to Walmart, okay? You were praying for them, come on, boys! <laughs> but we don't trust in the food chain industry. We don't trust in the world system because what we learned is it can fall short just like that. But those that fear God, he will deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine because of providence. One more, and I'm going to stop right here. How many want the angels of the Lord encamped around you? They're not encamped around everybody. They're not encamped around every Christian. We get one, we call the guardian angel. And sometimes because of the life we're living, his hands are tied. You know when you you get your comeuppance, that's a Missouri term, when you've been been sowing and you're getting ready to reap the whirlwind because you won't repent and all you do is sow bad seed, you basically have tied the hands of your angel. It's obedience when he hears you thinking it, speaking the word, and doing it really frees him up to do what he's supposed to do. But there are times we need more than one. And what's interesting is the angel of the Lord, when you, there's a great book called Who Ate with Abraham, it goes and shows that all these, that this is Jesus, that the captain of the host is Jesus, the angel of the Lord, the one sent from the face of the Father is Jesus. You want Jesus encamped around about you? Around those who fear him and rescues them. Oh, there's a song out right now that I love. It's called Jesus, You Are My Rescue Story. I look back at all the things that God brought Mary and I through, especially when we had the occult coming after us. It didn't help that I was stuck on stupid and that, you know, she was just learning and beginning to grasp of the depth of what's going on. Time and time and time again, we should have died, but God rescued. And what's crazy is we had an old beat-up minivan. You know, the kind that you floor and it says, I'll think about it. Okay. We got into a car chase on the highway and was able to elude them with a, wait a minute, wait a minute, (coughs) wait a minute. A lot of it had to do with Mary that waited till we got right to the exit and then jetted off. And we saw another vehicle stop in the passing lane and in a four-lane highway backed up to get that exit. I know about Jesus being my rescue story. Or about how when they drained all the uh, power steering fluid out of our power steering and replaced it with water so that it would seize up on us going down the highway. When I had my oil changed, they caught that and said, did you drive like through a six-foot creek? That's the only way that that could happen. And you know, amazing to them, they drained the water out, put a dryer through it, and put more power steering in it. That power steering lasted until the time we hauled it off to the junkyard with like 180,000 miles on it or something like that. Jesus is the rescue story. Or the time that we saw that we knew that we had Mexican mafia after us or different things. And Mary can even share more stories. She just scratches the surface in her book. Jesus is our rescue story. Because in the sad shape that we were back then, we respected him enough that whenever he showed us something from the word and said change, we changed. That's the God that we have to do, that we're dealing with. He's a God of miracles to those who fear him. His kingdom is opened to those that fear him. And I think right now what we need more than anything else 
is a baptism in the fear of the Lord. It's something that we can cry out for every day. Teach me to fear your name. Teach me to reverence you. It's not being preached. It's not being taught. It will not fly on Christian television, but teach me how to do it. That's one of my daily prayers. Soak me in the fear of the Lord. Let me be overcome. That's what baptized, be baptized in the Holy Spirit. When you, that's basically throwing you into the rapids and saying the water just overcame you. I want to be overcome by the fear of the Lord. So much so that I'm not doing things according to the flesh, but by the Spirit of God alone. That's where we need to be. And Father, I just pray for your grace, not only on myself, but everybody that listens to this message. Father, I ask that you would baptize us and teach us the fear of the Lord. Let this anointing from the Holy Spirit become the foremost anointing for our individual lives is to fear you and to respect you because it causes everything else to open up to us that we know in our hearts have been missing. Father, let us walk in it in truth as we learn to reverence you, reverence your word, your commandments, and your ways, and begin establishing our life solely on them. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name. In the Shinar Directive, we journey down the Luciferian rabbit hole to discover the matrix of darkness that has engulfed our planet. The Shirith Imperative, we dug deeper to unearth the power source of hell itself and how the body of Christ can labor to impede its functioning in the earth and lay the groundwork for revival. Now it is time to unveil the mysteries of both the priesthood of the kingdom of God and the priesthood of darkness. Until these mysteries are understood, God's remnant cannot realize their purpose or be released with heaven's power to overcome the agenda of the denizens of the second heaven. The Kingdom Priesthood is a training manual for the remnant to discover their priesthood, their purpose, and their service to Almighty God. In the pages of this remnant manual you will discover what Adam experienced in the first few moments of life and how those desires were written into the DNA of humanity. Revelations of what the Almighty meant when he told Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. Who were the first priests of the Kingdom of God in the Bible? And who was the first priest of darkness? What was the knowledge of the tree of good and evil offering the first family of humanity? How we all share the same calling as Abel. The reality of the principalities wars and how it is influencing the world today. As believers, how we are to function as both a priest and a tabernacle. The real purpose of the fire of God. How to carry the name of God in the earth with dignity and power. How the priesthood is essential for the releasing of end time warriors in the last days. How to flow in the sevenfold anointing of the Holy Spirit to represent Messiah. The Kingdom Priesthood is a call for the remnant to receive the fire of God and become the assembly that the gates of hell cannot overcome. Get your copy today at Amazon.com or KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com That's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. 
You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.